David Archuleta, welcome to Head on Fire. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Don. It's good to talk to you. Oh my gosh, it's such a, a treat and a dream uh, to get Aww. to speak with you. Um, I am so astonished by the trajectory of your career and the bravery of uh, your story. But for folks who might not know you uh, or sort of your journey, uh, tell people um, who you are and what it is that you do. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. My name is David <laughs> Archuleta, and I am a singer. I got my start. Well, people know me from my time on season seven of American Idol, year 2008. I was, um, I was, I got second, I was second place of my season and, uh, then got signed to a record label, went on the American Idol tour that year, released my first single crush and then released my album later that November that was also called David Archuleta. And that is what I'm most known for. I also am known for by the younger generation from being on iCarly and Hannah Montana. People, when they meet me, they don't realize I'm a real person a lot of the times because they thought I was a made up character on iCarly and Hannah Montana. <laughs> um, but I made cameos on there as myself. And yeah, I've been releasing albums ever since. I've released a lot more albums than I think most people, even people who know who I am, realize how many I've released. Uh, I've done two Christmas albums and I have been known um, for doing my Christmas tours. And yeah, I, I was also on The Masked Singer on the last season that they recently That's had. That's right. You were on and, The Masked Singer. <laughs> You kind yeah. of had like a little pop culture revival moment here in the last year from being on The Masked Singer, which the yes. funny thing is, I forgot that was even a show. And then suddenly people were like, oh my God, David Archuleta is on this thing and he is absolutely <laughs> killing it. Oh, thank you. It was very fun. I had some of my other friends on it. We were both in the semifinals together. How they did not continue to the finale, I don't know. I don't know what's up with that, but they were incredible because they're the pentatonics. They were the California sushi rolls and I was the macaw. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a lot of fun to do. And yeah, that's a little background. Are you, I, are you actually singing inside of that costume like live or is it like a recording when you're doing, you are live singing, singing live. inside I of a bird? To, I had to make sure that the microphone was up into the beak because they said, Hey, you need to stick it up in the beak because we can't hear you. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was just like, and this big, I couldn't, I had to like move to see like this because it was on my shoulders. I couldn't like move side to side. So, it was, yeah. of it was all fun. of the things that you've done in your career, did you ever have a moment when you thought, "I think I'm going to sing inside of a bird"? I I didn't. I did not ever <laughs> think that I would be dressed up like a big parrot. But it was so fun to do. It, I was a macaw because my mom is from Honduras, and so the macaw is the national bird of Honduras in Central America. So it was like a tribute to I love a macaw. Well. I love a bird. We are a bird loving family. Um, you <laughs> are, are you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We've, we've had a, a son Conyer. Um, I can't, what well, one day I told myself, uh, with my next book advance, we were, I'm probably going to get an African gray. I don't know if you know anything really? about African grays. Yeah. But they, yeah. they're like the world's they're the most, most talkative. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm really that is excited. So fun. Yeah. We're going to name him Appa. Like from You're... Avatar: The Last Airbender. Oh no way! Yeah, I love I love Avatar: The Last Airbender. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so, just like okay. Doctor Doolittle, a little bit. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's my husband. You... My husband's a veterinarian. He's the Doctor Doolittle. I just get oh. the benefit of uh, I just get the benefit of of living in a house with somebody that loves animals as much as I do. Oh, that's so fun. So it's funny that you bring up the mass singer because you are no stranger to singing competitions. Obviously, you got you. I would say you got your start on American Idol, but that's almost not true. I mean, yeah. you began winning singing competitions. So I mean, I I was in talent competitions when I was ten years old, but I was winning. You were? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, what overachieving gay millennial wasn't? Um, but <laughs> I mean, like I was winning little like district what like amongst my school like i was winning little best actor awards meanwhile you're out there winning like major singing competitions at the age of 10 you won star search at the age of 12 and i don't i don't think i understood internally i don't think i had 
fully put it into the marrow of my bones that you were an entire 16-year-old child when you were on American Idol. And I, you know, a lot of child actors, a lot of folks who get that kind of exposure at a young age, you know, you're doing it because you're kind of on this, this path of following your talent. You're, you've got a talent, you're really good at something, and and it just kind of creates a kind of momentum. There's an inertia to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, while you're learning to be somebody else, while you're learning to be this kind of stage version of yourself, there's also that that time spent that you're you're supposed to be learning how to be yourself as well. Did all of those eyeballs, did all of that publicity at such a young age, did that affect you in any way? Did you have any understanding of what was going on? Did you have any level of perspective at that time that that what you were doing was a little different than everybody else your age? I It was happening so fast that I didn't even have time to process what was going on. Like I knew I was on American Idol. I was a fan of it from season one, watching Kelly Clarkson, Justin sure. Carini to Myra Gray. And I just was like, this... What is happening? Like I was literally in high school. I was in my junior year earlier that year. And then by the, by just a few months later, by May, I was known on this national television, television show. It was at the peak of its watching time. And especially with the writer strike going on at the time, it was like, there wasn't as much to choose from. So I think that's what made people hone in even more on the show. And so <sighs> It was nuts. I then going on the, the national tour and I was just like, uh, what's happening? Am I, my life's never going to be the same again. And I don't know if I want to, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for it to change like this, this quickly. But, um, you know, I think when you're 16 years old, you're still like, I was kind of like, I was relieved because I was having to start working and I was like, well, this is a, this is a way for me to make my living, which I didn't know how I was going to make at that time. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, it was, I think it's tricky because you're kind of just pushed into this machine mm -hmm. and a lot of people suddenly look at you as, okay, we're going to, you're a mon our money making machine. And I think a lot of uh, young artists and entertainers fall into that trap where you're a child, so you, but you're not fully protected from, all these people who want to manipulate you however they want to get money out of you. And so, you know, I was in the same, I was in the same time of Jonas brothers, Demi Lovato, uh, who I went on tour with actually, um, mm -hmm. Selena Gomez, Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus. So it was, we were all in this, that same time of like teen teeny boppers, me musicians. <laughs> and I, I took a break from it because when I was like a few years later, I took a break from my career to be a, a missionary for my church. So I didn't mm -hmm. follow in that same time frame. And people are like, well, you messed up your, your career. And maybe I did. Who knows? I, I probably did because for me, I was like, well, I need to serve God. You know, I was really integrated into my religion at the time. I grew up church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints AKA Mormon. Um, but I just thought, well, I, God got me here in the first place. So I'm going to continue serving God because my life is in his hands. So um, I think that's the reason why I was no longer part of that circle mm -hmm. <laughs> of the, of that generation of um, singers that came from Disney and Nickelodeon and whatnot. You know, you, you say that you, maybe in retrospect think that you might have messed up your career I, I i disagree i don't even know that you can i mean can you even have full agency over a career when you're 16 17 years old i mean can you can you i mean if i if i chose the path that i wanted when i was 16 17 and i let that go i would be a stage magician right now <laughs> i mean right. or i would be some kind of like really terrible like dinner theater actor or something like that. Like I, I, I think that, you know, that there's, there's a couple of ways of kind of doing a music career, it seems. And, you know, just from somebody who's on the outside, you have the artists that take 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight year, you know, several years in between projects to kind of, okay, we, we go, we put it out, we come back, we, we write, we live, we, you know, figure out whenever the re- next time is. And the other way, like your uh, debut twin, Taylor Swift, is seemingly to put an album out at the speed that you can write it, like every year or so. And it seemed like, I mean, you want to talk about being in a machine, that's a that's a machine. That those those folks that are putting out that kind of regularity, that's 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 a machine. When you began, your debut album came out in 2008. In the next 2 years, you released two more albums. You had three albums in like less than 3 years. Um how much of that process do you feel like you had any ownership of and did you have any opportunity to you know, did you have any opportunity to come for up for air? And how did all of that help to frame that mission trip for you? Was was that mission trip just like a sigh of relief almost to get out of that? It it was actually because I I didn't feel like I had control over my life. I didn't really have a say, you know, American Idol, like I looked at it as I prayed about it, but my dad told me to pray about it. So I was just mm-hmm. really it was he wanted me to be a famous singer. He wanted he believed in my talent, which I'm grateful for because I didn't believe in it. But um, I felt like I was always living my life for to make someone else happy. So I went on mm-hmm. American Idol to make my dad happy and my family and continued with the record label. I tried to make the record label happy and my management and, and still my parents and my you know, my dad mainly and my family. And um, then I had the fans. Like I had a new fan base that I was trying to like, I don't know what they want me to be. I was, so I was just like what I was trying my best to appease to them. And then when I went on, on my mission, it was like serving God. But in the way, um, it was kind of a way for me to appease to something that was for me and not everybody else. And I felt like I was able to discover my own voice to a certain extent on my mission. Cause it, you have to talk to a bunch of people and connect with them. And yeah, you're trying to, convince them on your religion and but there are a lot of beautiful things to it like serving them and I I got to sing for them all the time without them caring about my status of celebrity like I just was able to sing for them and then they felt the emotion of the song and I thought that was really nice and then when I got back from my mission I felt like it was I served in Chile for two years in, in South America and when I, it was it was just a nice escape from the whole like look how awesome I am I need a I need to be important and famous and and get people excited about me all the time it was a nice break from that so when I got back I was like do I want to keep singing I needed to learn how to do it for myself but at the same time I was still then when I got back from a mission it was like well is the church going to be okay with what I'm doing is God okay with what I'm doing? So I was constantly like under that bubble. I was in the bubble of, well, I need to be church appropriate. I need to appease to my church leaders. Like I thought it was God, but it was really to the leaders of my church that I was trying to get approval from. Again, I'm like constantly fighting. Like I was always like trying to, you know, um, appease to whatever authority figure I had at the time. And now I'm in finally where I'm at now, like I've, I've had a faith transition because I came out as queer a couple of years ago. And that is, there isn't really a, a healthy space um, f- for queer people in a lot of religion, um, including the one I grew up in uh, with Latter-day Saints, because they're like, well, no, like if you get, if you want to marry someone of your same sex, then you will we'll excommunicate you. So I, I was like, well, but with my own answers, with my relationship with God, like here I was, I, I'd been, I tried to get married with three different girls at three different times of my life thinking, oh, it's not working out because, oh, because we didn't really get along or, oh, maybe I need to find the right, right girl. And then when I felt like I found the, the great most ideal girl I could have found. And it still wasn't working out. I was just like, I was like, I have, I'm feeling, I'm realizing I'm, I'm attracted to guys. 
and I've never given, given myself the chance to understand that part of me. And I've always hated that part of me. And I thought that by marrying a girl that it would get rid of my feelings for guys. And when I was each time that I was engaged to a girl and realized those feelings are as alive and well as ever, I was like, I'm a failure. I, I messed up. So there I was praying to God saying, please change me, please change me. I'd spent like 15 years of my life doing that and it never worked, but I thought I'm just going to go for one more last hurrah and spend a couple months doing that in my last engagement to a girl. And I was just like, God's not answering me. He must hate me because of the way I am. And I was just like, I don't have his, his approval. Like, again, I was constantly seeking that approval. And I got to a point where, where I was just like, well, I, I think if I'm going to be this way anyway, and eventually probably going to um, give in to those feelings, um, it's probably better for me to just cut my life short and end it. Mm-hmm rather than accept that this could be my fate of just being gay or being bi, whatever I, I may have might be just the fact that I liked guys is not okay. And I, so I was like, if I can't get rid of it, I want my soul to be protected. I don't want Mm. it to stain it by falling in love potentially with a guy. So I prayed one last time and I was like, God, if you're really there, please just change me because I'm so tired of this. And, and God just said, um, from what I understood of God, because now I look at it as it, it, God was taught to me to be something very specific. Like mm-hmm. God is a white bearded man. Mm-hmm. And, and with Mormons, it's like God is married to a woman. So to become like God, I needed to marry a woman, if I'm a boy, and uh, create offspring. But then in that prayer with God, God responded to me saying, like, David, you need to stop asking me this. You've been asking me this for o- over half of your life now. And you can see it's not going to change because I don't intend for it to change. And you need to understand um, what you need to understand that. I don't see you the same way you see yourself. I don't see you the same way a lot of well-meaning, well-meaning religious people see it. They, they think they are following me, but they're not. And I was just like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to make a mistake. And, and then I felt God say, like, well, then perhaps you need to do what you think are mistakes. Because you're allowed, David, you're allowed to make mistakes. I give you permission to do so. It's okay. That's how you learn. And you, as you do that, you'll realize what you thought were mistakes actually aren't. And... Um, I don't know. Like I still believe in something, something greater. Cause I felt that so clearly. I don't know if it's my higher self, but it's just this elevated thing that connects everyone and everything together. Uh, but I just don't believe it's the, what in my Christian background and religion teaching me that God is homophobic or does is disapproving of gay people uh, L- LGBT plus people because they're not human, because that's not what God told me. God said, you are loved actually as you are. I create you, even though people don't understand things that are different. It, people don't like things that are different a lot of times and they can be afraid of it. It causes fear mongering. Like you see it with different, like if someone looks different from you, like you don't understand it. You're afraid of it. If someone speaks a different language from you, it's like, I don't understand this. So if, I wish people had more compassion and realize just because religious people, I wish if, if there's something that you could take time to think of, it's like, just because this is not the standard way, the normal, what the general population experiences, it doesn't mean it's evil. Just because someone is born with alopecia and is missing hair does not make them less of a person. But like realize, acknowledge that if someone is in a wheelchair or something, it's like, well, that's, oh, that's different. Or someone, if someone with dark skin is in like a mainly white population that all the kids are like, what? Like what, why does that person have different skin than I do? And they're kind of uncomfortable because they're not familiar with it. But just because it makes you uncomfortable does not make it a sign from God that it is evil. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fear mongering with people saying, 
oh, we'll protect our children, LGBT communities always aiming for our kids and trying to groom them. And it's like, no, they're not. You know, m- gay people, bi people, queer people, they just want to connect with whether whatever their identity is. Sorry. Uh, they, for the most part, we want to just love another consenting adult who happens to be the same sex as we are. We want to go to the movies with them, go have lunch together, share our goals and dreams together, see how we can help each other grow and reach those goals. And yes, even start families. Um, but I don't, where this grooming children thing, I don't understand it because heterosexual people groom children a lot. Like in my own family, it wasn't the gay people. It wasn't my gay cousin who was grooming the kids. It was one of the heterosexual males who was grooming the girls and abusing them. But for some reason, people still, it's like, but like everyone, especially in Hispanic culture, they like let the, the abusive uncles and grandpas and dads slide because we've got to protect the man, the macho man. And yet the gay ones are the ones that are grooming the children when they're not. <laughs> and I'm sure there are, Gay people yeah, it's a historical fear mongering tactic to say, "Oh, won't somebody think about the children? My poor children. Oh, what about the kids?" And it's like, I just don't think you understand that kids are not born hating people. That's just not how. That's just not how kids work. <laughs> which is why I work. loved. Which is why I loved your TikTok video. Oh, thank that, you. <laughs> that that was the one. That's how we got connected because I was just like, mm-hmm. "Oh my gosh!" I reposted this because you were talking about. Like, yes, like protect the children. What about the queer children? Because you and I both knew we were different when we were little, but there were no resources to understand, like, why am I different? Why am I this? Why am I this way? And we're like seven, eight, nine. How old were you when you? Oh, God. Um, (laughs) I... I was, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was, my uncle, my uncle likes to tell a story that, and I don't even remember this because I was that young. Uh, oh. uh, do you remember the McDonald's Happy Meals that were, th- that there were two different toys? McDonald's used to do two different toys for Happy Meals and one was the Hot Wheel and one was the Barbie. Oh, I, I don't know if I remember that. Okay, I, I, so maybe once upon a time and the long, long ago, McDonald's used to do uh, Happy Meals that had Barbie toys or Hot Wheels toys. And uh, my uncle took me to McDonald's and got me a Happy Meal. And I opened the box and I screamed bloody murder. Because and he's like, "What is wrong?" And I said, "I wanted the Barbie because they had given me the Hot Wheels." I was like, Aww. fully like maybe three or four. I don't know, um, it, Uncle. If you're listening to this, let me know. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, so he had to like turn the car around and go back to McDonald's and like get me the Barbie toy. Like I was oh just kind of gosh. always. I was always different. And what is that? Where did Aww. that difference come from? What does that mean? I don't know. I don't, I had never been a kid before. That was the only way I knew how to be a kid. That was just what I was naturally interested in, you know? And I think that that's, that's what a lot of people don't get is that, is that, you know, queer adults had to come from somewhere and we're not a monolith either. Like, we're not all the same. Just because I grew up wanting the Barbie toy doesn't mean that some other queer kid didn't grow up wanting the tool set or the Tonka toys or the whatever, right. or wanting both or wanting all of it. I mean, like, there's no yeah, one way like, to have been a queer kid. I like Hot Wheels and Barbies. So. <laughs> well, that I, aligns I like with your journey, sir. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> but what was hard was when I started having feelings for kids in the class, like I did... The first one I recognized was a girl. But when I started uh-huh. having feelings for a boy, I was just like, wait, like I was in second grade. Like all my kids, yeah. were ta- all the kids were talking about that girl's cute. I have a crush on this person. And I was like, okay. I remember the girl, like, and her name was Alyssa. And I was like, oh, I just, I had that feeling for her. Like, oh, she's so cute and like pretty and stuff. And I want to like be around her. And I want to, like, I wanted her to play with me. But then I started feeling that for one of my, friends that was a boy and here I am like eight years old. And I'm like, huh? I didn't know what was going on. I was just like, Oh, that's strange. But when I kept <laughs> feeling that, like wanting, feeling that feeling like I want to be around him and stuff, I felt really embarrassed. And so I started like, 
isolating myself from the other kids. I tried to play sports with the other, my other classmates, but they, they said I was, I was like a girl. I played like a girl because I didn't know how to, I didn't have hand-eye coordination. So I felt really embarrassed and I was like, something's wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. And I remember my parents put me in a gymnastics class and I always um, wanted to do gymnastics. I really, I can't tell you. I have this life. I'm very tall. I'm six foot six. And I, since oh, I can wow. remember, it's probably because I grew up watching Power Rangers and my favorite Power Ranger was Billy, the blue one. Um, and in real life, oh. David Yost is a gymnast as well. And like, he could do a backflip. Oh. And I remember they did this like spot where like, oh, in real life, Billy is like an excellent gymnast and he can do a backflip. And I have ever since I was like in third grade, I have always wanted to be able to do a backflip. And I am very jealous that you were in. That's why I was always like really, um, like I never wanted to play sports, but I was very interested in cheerleaders because like male cheerleaders could also do gymnastics. And I really wanted, Mm. oh my gosh, I really wanted to learn to do a backflip. Oh, yeah. I'm so jealous. You're over, I'm over a foot shorter than you are because I'm five, five. And, but I did my, I didn't learn how to do a backflip until I was 29. Really? So, oh, that's recent. Yeah. That you was like five to, like, minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was three years ago. So yeah, I, I learned during COVID because one of my friends, when I was one of the Are girls there videos? I was to get Have to you know. posted videos? Yeah, I posted a video. I'm going to need Instagram. to go back and find, wow. I'm going to need to go back and find David Archa Flippa. Doing, <laughs> doing some doing some flipping it was just like one like just a back foot, like boom like i just one i recorded i i cleaned out my uh can Instagram you do the back tuck though. without the hands can you do the back tuck i don't think so i don't i okay. I, I, I use my i use my hands too. yeah but anyway um yeah so i there we are like like there that's why i loved your video because you helped people who may not understand I, I told you this before but like you helped people who may not understand like so many people coming from religion or who don't understand queer queerness think that it's suddenly a choice that someone makes later on in life like i'm just gonna like the same sex now because i want to i want to be um I want the worst life controversial. Ever. <laughs> i want to be controversial and be uh, the oddball it's like no like when we, this is we were kids when we started experiencing these feelings and we were never able to get rid of them no matter how much many of us tried mm-hmm. it's just we so for you to be able to explain your journey and tell the story in a way that anyone could understand whether you're religious conservative or queer it was something that made sense like you could listen and be like, Oh, that makes sense. Like I never thought of it that way. Cause all you hear is the protect our children narrative. Mm-hmm. And I love that you took it head on in such, um, just like a non-confrontational way. It wasn't like, well, you suck and blah, blah, blah. A lot of times we get in just like a, you're the bad guy. No, you're the bad guy. You're terrible. No, you're terrible. You're able to be like, I want you to see it in the way that I experience it. Like you brought them to the table and, in a non-threatening, de-escalating type of way. And I just loved it so much because it was so heart-wrenching as well to hear the struggle of not understanding yourself, getting bullied, and you trying to fit in, trying not to be queer or gay. But people see that you are different and they call you a girl and they call you all all the names and stuff. And I I related to it so much because I got called a girl a lot of times too just because I wasn't masculine enough, even when I was trying to be. Like they still call you a girl. So it's like, you know, help, yes, teach your children to be nice, to be respectful, because there are going to be kids who are different. And um, so I. And that's what I think a lot of people. Well, that's, that's really kind of you, but that's what I think a lot of people don't realize. And the reason that I approach some of the ways that I make the content that I do, um, telling my own journey or, 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 relaying information in the way that it is, uh, there's this concept, you know, if you ever take a sociology 101 class, there's in-group, out-group dynamics. And the reason why there is a lot of um, division and fear of the other is uh, that people have an in-group. And everybody's first in-group is like their immediate family. 
and those are the people that you end up trusting the most. And what an in, when you're in an in-group, you tend to believe implicitly in the goodness of the people that are in your in-group. And you trust those people, and you're more the, uh, willing to believe um, that they did right and people from an out-group did wrong. And as you grow up and you meet more kinds of people and you spend more time with those kinds of people and you learn their stories and you learn about their families and you learn, you know, about their similarities and differences, slowly people from the, that out group become part of your in group. And so your circle expands and it gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And people who are in that in group, you tend to believe better of. You tend to believe, well, they're like me. And, you know, if I were in your position and I were put in front of that, you know, tough situation and you, you did the best you could in that tough situation, you, you tend to believe better of them. You tend to believe they're more honest and trustworthy. Uh, you tend to be more forgiving when they make mistakes. You tend to, uh, believe in them whenever they, um, you know, are trying for something, you know, that you, you see them as you. And so the way that I try to tell my story is to say, listen, we are not as we are different. We are very different in a lot of ways, but we are still the same in that we were both at one point just kids trying to be kids. And the only way that either of us knew how. And the reason why so many queer kids, kids of color, disabled kids, anybody that experiences intersections of marginality, anytime those kids aren't allowed the same grace to be kids, to figure out how to be a kid because they just have to be the thing everybody talks about instead of just getting to be a kid, um, it's a lot harder for them. You know, you talk a lot in your story about ownership, Um, you know, that you didn't have a lot of ownership over your voice. I mean, like literally your voice, like your actual voice, your instrument, uh, when you sang, where you sang, why you sang, seem to be governed by other people. And a lot of your own narrative is, um, I-, I relate to it quite a bit because I also kind of grew up with that people-pleasing behavior. You know, I, I was the talented kid. I was the smart kid. And I was always trying to use those talents to impress the people that I thought I was supposed to impress and the, be the very best version at all times. And you have to be perfect and you have to show up and you have to hit all the marks. And you, if you mess up, then that is, that's a sign that, that you're just not good enough and you're just, you know, um, and you have to be good enough because you have to be as good as as other people's dreams of you are. And I wonder, when did you start finding ownership again of your voice, of your talent, of your story, of yourself? Because you touched earlier on the fact that you were in such a dark place that you considered ending your life, and I have been there. Mm. And I don't think people realize, if they've never been in that spot, that that is for a lot of people, the first time they ever felt a sense of ownership Mm -hmm. in that I could own the, I don't, I, I can't control a lot of things. I don't have a lot of control in this life. And there's a lot of things that seem to be outside of my control, including my own intrinsic identity, which seems to be a horrible thing, apparently. Mm -hmm. But I could own the choice to end that life. That that could be the first time I truly feel like I oh, I have agency, or I could choose to live, and that is also maybe the first time I have agency. I feel like I have ownership. When was that moment for you? When when was the first time that you made that first choice for yourself, and that you began to govern and have your own agency? Um, I feel like it's been. It's, it wasn't necessarily just one moment for me, like mm. going on a mission while I was still appealing to one person, I was able to break myself away from my former captor in a sense, like my dad or my record label and such. Then when I got back from my mission, I started going to therapy. Yay, and therapy. <laughs> yes. A, a therapy has been a huge part of learning what my voice is because they would – they would try to separate me from the voices that were planted into my head that weren't my voice. Mm-hmm. So a the, lot of the things that I said would say like, this is what I'm supposed to think. This is what I should say. This is what I should do. And there'd be like, according to who? And I'd be like, well, cause it's what's right for me. And like realizing a lot of that was, 
influence from my leaders at church, my parents growing up, the what I thought my audience wanted from me. And um, I guess when I was getting, you know, I was trying to appease still to like the plan, like the God plan I was told was God's plan for me of marriage to a girl and starting a family with her. And when I started realizing that wasn't my story, I was trying to fit someone else's story. And when I got my answer from God, you know, my understanding of God, or my, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'll still call it God for now. Um, God showed me, it's like, actually, no, you were told something different from than what I am. And mm. saying like, I actually love you as you are. I'm not, I'm not going to damn you because of this part of, of you exists. God saying like, I know that part exists. Like I, I'm the one who brought you in to, to, to life as you are like this. Is the, so, but contemplating ending my life, I think I realized, well, what's, you know, if, if I, is it worse to end my life this way or to end my life by living a different life? Hmm. Um, living differently and that would take a lot more guts and i was like i don't think i want to face that all the people i'm going to disappoint it's not worth living by disappointing everyone i think i made my life's purpose in making sure i didn't disappoint people that i met Mm -hmm. their expectations and um when i realized maybe it's worth living even if i disappoint everybody that's when I finally felt empowered and emboldened in a way I never had felt before because I was like, I could actually live my life for me. And that's still something I'm still trying to figure out because I think I'm still like trying to appease like, Oh, I don't want to be too crazy and wild because I still want to appease to the conservative audience I have. Um, But like, and also it's like, well, I've, am I, am I queer enough for my new queer audience that is trying to like be excited and cheer me on? It's like, you still like have that in your head where it's like, I want to but peace I mean, to everybody. You, you, you've, you've been trying to figure this out for a really long time and you only just did. And like, you're, you, you've only just now given yourself this little pocket, this little bubble of time to be be out and to start making decisions for yourself to figure out what makes you happy and to figure out what decisions you want to make and how much of that you want to share with people and realizing that you kind of have that choice to share and not share, but that none of it is a lie and that people, that, that people can meet you on your terms. So I, I mean, listen, just as a fan and as somebody that, that has been on a similar journey, I mean, uh, uh, not, not, I'm, <laughs> I've never competed with Rihanna for the number one spot on her chart. No, <laughs> I'm not saying we have journeys like that, but I'm just saying like similar uh, personal journeys. But like, you, you get time, David Archuleta. Like, you get to have time, you get all the time you need to figure all of those things out. And you also need to give yourself the grace to make mistakes because you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna think that you're doing the right thing and you're thinking that you're gonna share some part of yourself and you're gonna get burned and you're, mm. and, and, and it's all gonna, it's all gonna be beautiful. It's all gonna be uh, your journey because it will be authentic and honest and it will be yours and it'll be the first time that you own it. So I just want you to know like there's no rush. There's no rush. For you to get all of this right, you've only been authentically yourself for yourself, and at the same time, having to do this in front of millions of people for like two years. <laughs> I mean, like two years. You're a two year old. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay not to have it figure out. <laughs> oh, I mean, you are in many so ways. I mean, you yeah. are in so many ways. There's so much of the way that you're going to live your life that is so brand new. And I think it's okay okay for you to and I, take the time to figure that part out and i have been and it and it does it feels like a different life like i'm the same person like i've worked, like the person i am today exists and has like the my like the the mindsets i have the habits that i have because i've lived for over 30 years of it to create produce all of that yet 
like it was all designed and programmed to be something else. Like I consciously programmed myself to be one way while instinctually and naturally, like I tend to flow another way, especially like with dating guys, for example, and just, and, and stepping away from religion and like the construct of like living within the means and rules and the regulations that a a religion has. It's like, now what, now what do I do? I have, I'm used to having this, I'm not used to having this freedom. And so it's kind of tempting to find another thing to be like constricted by, because I'm used to being constricted, (laughs) restricted Mm -hmm. and living by, you know, that's like a religious thing is to sacrifice and to suffer patiently and, and to, you know, so sacrificing by like living within restrictions. And so it's like, okay, what do I do now when I don't have them? I'm like, I innately still restrict myself just because that's, more what i'm used to but like if i decide to push the limits i don't have any necessarily any consequences other than people being like what are you doing um but it's like it'll be an interesting place to now delve into but i'm glad i did now because if i if i feel like i came out earlier like in 2008 when i was a teen late teenager like that it was a lot of drama i was a mormon still and the mormons were really against going against prop 8 in california it was a very well known thing amidst our church i don't think i would have been as safe to come out then mm. I, I mean 2008 I was a very different time it was a very different time yeah in in so many ways <laughs> and so for people who had the guts and courage to come out then and even before that you know even decades before um which allow and to speak out allowed people like me to have an easier time to come out when they did. And I'm so grateful for them. Um, it's unfortunate that things are backtracking a little bit during the political mm-hmm. year. You know, it usually gets more dramatic during political before the elections. Um, but that's, you know, I'm glad I came out when I did because my family, I learned how to, express myself something i didn't Mm. know when i was 18 17 20 even 20 21 it to come out as at 30 and explain to people this is why and to even have that time it's like i spent 15 years trying to make something else work and that wasn't working for me it allowed people to listen to my story more and have more compassion for for the queer gay experience and I'm so glad for that. So I, I wouldn't change the delay in age. I've met people who've come out when they're 40, 50, sure. 60, 70, even 80 years old. And, um, you know, they had kids, they had grandkids. And they um, to hear their stories of coming out, like, I'm like, wow. And for them to say, like, I missed, they're like, I wonder on all the life I missed. And I'm like, okay, I've wondered that. Like, okay, I wonder what I missed during like my my teenage years of being like a young, excited person to meet people. Well, I'm like, you know what? I still have a, I'm thankful that I have the life I have to live still looking forward. Um, I feel like I'm young enough to still be like, oh, I can st- still it's like i'm reliving my teenage years because <laughs> i didn't really get to live them i was very restricted with everything and now i'm like okay i'm free now what um, <laughs> Have, what is that like to get to reintroduce yourself to people who have known you your entire life close friends family what is it like to get to kind of reorient those relationships on your own terms oh gosh it was scary at first like i I think that also helped coming out publicly and Mm -hmm. being a public figure um, because even my friends who I don't see all the time saw that post and talked about it. And if they didn't see it, someone told them about it. So (laughs) it was a nice, like clean swoop so that everyone I knew pretty much found out and to be able to have public support as well. Like if they were uneasy about it to, for them to have friends like who were saying like, I'm excited for him. Like that must've been hard. That must've been a difficult journey. Like, I feel like and yeah, I had more scrutiny as well. Like a lot of people from the, where I was coming from like religious, I had people also saying like, you know what, you know, this is not of God and it doesn't matter 
it doesn't matter if you're a celebrity, like they would say that it doesn't matter if you're a celebrity or not. This doesn't give you a pass to, to be queer now and live a <laughs> sinful, evil life and shame on you and things like that. But I'm like, oh, you, know you what? went Hollywood. Oh, you went so Hollywood. Now you're exactly. just like kiss boys, you weirdo Holly weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah everyone that is so funny because that's what they say like hollywood has corrupted you and things and it's like you don't under with time i hope you know a lot of people they'll just see what they want to see they'll just want to complain and point their finger and say bad gay bad queer person shame <laughs> on you um and then move on with their life and, and find the next thing to be upset about but it's like if you understood like this is something i've been fighting since uh, before the holly weird hollywood stuff this is like you know, first, second grade that I've been trying to make sense of it. And now I can finally make sense out of it. Spending 25 years confused, not understanding what was going on is finally clear. And it's so freeing, so refreshing. And to just be like, okay, I I understand you. Like looking in the mirror, I now understand you. And I love all the parts of you that you once were afraid of. And it's Mm. so invigorating. You know, um, a part of kind of your reintroduction, your your uh, reclaiming of your own story, of your career, of your voice, literally and figuratively, has been a, a whole new round of interviews. Um, and I very rarely go and watch or listen or read interviews of my upcoming guests for lots of reasons. One, I don't want to like psych myself out of a particular question. I don't want to like tell myself, oh, well, he's already been asked that question because like, of course you have. It's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. <laughs> um, so, but I, and I, so I don't really watch a lot of like interviews of, of people that I'm about to interview. Um, but I did in your case, cause I was just kind of curious, like, I'm always curious what how people are treated uh, by the media whenever they kind of have to publicly reintroduce themselves. And I was shocked uh, a bit, um, is, is putting it mildly, that like you sit down on a couch or you hop on a microphone or you get on the radio and it seems like no matter what the venue is, everyone's first question to you is basically some version of, so what's it like to be gay in public now? Uh, yeah. What's, uh, what's it like to have to answer that question over and over and over again in front of millions of people? And why, it's so, why do you think people are so fascinated with asking you that question? I know. It's so funny because I think so many people assume that like I was living a double life. Like I was closeted, so secretly doing one thing and I just uh-huh. didn't, wasn't able to tell anyone. It's like, no, I came out and told y'all when I realized what I was. Uh-huh. Like, I'm like, oh, I must be this. And this is why all my failed engagements keep failing and trying to date girls. It's like... So it is funny. Like people ask me like, so what's your favorite drag move as if, as if I've been like a closeted drag fan. And it's like, I've never watched drag. Like you, y'all don't understand. Like I was in a completely different world. Like uh-huh. LGBT was so foreign to me because I was told to stay away from it. I was yeah. told like, don't contaminate yourself. Like stay away from that. It might drag you down. And that's why I've always felt like horrible because I'm like, I'm secretly like this. And what if I'm going to corrupt the people around me, even though I don't know what I'm doing? I just like you're around someone and you start feeling like I might bump into somebody and turn them gay. Uh Oh, (laughs) yeah. I'm like, if I talk to them, am I going to like cause them to have feelings that are inappropriate? That's actually how it works. Um, That's actually that's scientifically that's how it works. You just you have a conversation and then they're gay. (laughs) <laughs> it's great. It's a good. It's a good thing. I've made a lot of people oh gay God. just by being like, "Hi." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's funny that I, you know, I, what was the question? It was I. Um, yeah, it's it's funny because it's like I don't know what it's like. Like I'm figuring that out right now. <laughs> so what is it like to be to be queer? Um, it's like I'm learning because it's something new for me. Uh, it feels pretty much the same other than like instead of trying to date a girl, I'm just dating a guy, you know, it, that that's really the difference. And because of that, like, yeah, I've let go of my religion, religious beliefs. And in the process of like saying like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense because God does not look at it the same way I was told 
he, he's God sees it. Like, I don't, I call it he, but I don't know if it's even God's a he, because I question everything because when people say God's against a LGBT, anything, and it's like, wait a second, like my relationship with God and like the revelation I received is that's not the case. So I'm like, mm-hmm. well, what else did you tell me wrong about God? Um, so anyway, it's, but there has to be a push and pull of, you know, you've always been a singer and you do want to continue to have a professional singing career. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and it, it has to, it has to be that there has to be some kind of internal push and pull of, well, these other singers aren't straight singers. They're just singers. But for some reason now I have to be the queer singer. Yeah. Like, like that's the codifier like, now. Like, it's like suddenly I'm like the queer casted person in this or that, or like, mm-hmm. and it's like, I don't want to try to meet. What is that word? I meet someone's like, they have stereotype? to meet their it, stereotype. I, that's not the word. It's like, they have to like get their casting call. Like they have to have something of each thing. Oh yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Meet their, their diversity quota. <laughs> their quota. Thank you. Yeah. They have to meet their quota now with having me involved and stuff. And I'm just like, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I'm glad, I'm glad that they're including, including me and it allows me to tell my story. Right. But it is, it's like, that's not all I am. It's not like I'm suddenly now this gay, gay. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't even know how to be gay. Like I, I don't, honestly, I, I thought it was just allowing yourself to love someone, but now everyone's saying, well, well, you may not be into drag now, but we'll make you because you're to be a proper gay. And it's like, what is a proper gay? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I thought you just can be yourself. I thought it was about freely being who you are and figuring that out, not having to fit another. And I think like, allowing I already... people, allowing people to go on their own journey and figuring out their own comfort level and their own likes and dislikes and tastes and stuff like that. And that can change and that can evolve and it can devolve and it can do all sorts of things because it's your journey. It's not anybody else's. Yeah. I like, I still like to play board games and video games with my straight friends. So it's like, and then, because when of, I, pe- what, I'm sorry, what kind of board games do you like to play? Do you like to play Clue? <laughs> and if you like to play Clue, which which is your favorite character? This is now the most important thing to me. You know, I'm I haven't played Clue in a while. What so, kind of board games I'm do you sorry. play, David Archuleta? Okay, last night we played um, Dixit. I'm sorry, you played what? Dixit. Dixit. No, Where what is like, this? There, there are a bunch of um, cards, and they're play like. You have to like tell us like it's like someone's imagination that was like very artistic. It could be like a bunch of butterflies flying through outer space. Uh huh. And so that's your card. And everyone has like a pile of these cards. Like it could be like a camel swimming underwater, like just very imaginative things. Um, and someone will be like, okay, if it's like the butterflies in outer space, you could just be like, um, like you have to tell a story like out of this world and then you put your card face down and everyone has to pick out of their cards. Like, okay, what seems most relevant to that theme? Like out of this world, like one of my cards last night was like, may, may this be a light for you in dark places when all the other lights go out, which is a Lord of the Rings reference. Uh And so it was like this, this card that was like someone was holding a little light and they were inside of a light bulb and Uh outside of the light bulb, it was dark. Uh huh. So that was my reference. So everyone had to find a card that was like, "Hey, wh- what card of mine fits that ca- like theme of may a light? This. May this be a light for you?" And then everyone flips their cards over, and you have to guess which one was the original one. And everyone votes for it, and you. So whoever, if, if they guess your card, then you get more points. But if everyone guesses your card then you don't get any points because it was too obvious. So you have to make it so it's not too obvious, but obvious enough that some people at least will get your card. So it's it's really fun. I just need you to know that if anybody is ever telling you that you're not doing queerness correctly, an obsession with an obscure board game is literally the exact (laughs) correct way to queer. It is the the most correct way to queer. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, but this is with my straight friends. You are correct. Uh, Yeah, but still, my straight friends introduced this to me. 
Okay. Just saying, well, but, th- they're well, all we just, also have greedy, game just a tiny little, <laughs> just a little bit, a tiny bit. They are great allies. <laughs> Good ally. <laughs> they are great allies. They're great allies. We do have game nights with some of my my gay guy friends as well. So it's like a mix. Uh-huh. It's like a nice, fun blend. Of who's better? Who's gay better at board games? Gays or straights? Tell me. I don't know. Um, Start a war here, David Archuleta. Who's better at board a, games? Um, I, I don't know, but I will say I did win both rounds last night. So <gasps> congratulations! There's something to I, that. You know, you're a singer. You're an artist. You're a creative person, and I don't want to fall into the trap of other people of kind of codifying you as a queer artist. So I just I want to ask you as a creator to a creator. I mean, I'm an author. I'm, uh, you know, I write, write stories and, you know, people pay me for them. But, um, yeah. one of the things that, uh, you have to learn as a creative person is whose opinion matters to you. And one of the first lessons that you have to learn is that not everybody's opinion can matter to you because then you fall into the trap of trying to m- write a book that literally everybody will like and there is no book that literally everybody will like um so you have to let you have to you have to kill your darlings in that way and just give mm. up that give up that dream um yeah. how did you find a way in your own creative process to figure out whose voice mattered to you and how to only listen to those and protect your creative peace um, really, I, I think I just get my like small in, inner community, excuse me, my small inner community. So like friends, my family, people that I work with that I trust and just try to get their ideas. And I'm like, what do mm-hmm. you think of this? And they know me, they usually know what I'm trying to accomplish. So that's usually what I do. To, so that way I'm like getting positive feedback. So because I'm very indecisive as well. So I think that's why I've always latched on to some kind of authority figure to follow. Um, but I'm learning how to just say like, I like this, so I'm going to do this. That (laughs) is very difficult for me because I'm so used to being like, but it's not religion teaches you. It's not about what you want. It's about what God Uh wants. Mm -hmm. But then what's tricky about that. It's not really what God wants It's what the, the church goers actually want. And a lot of times they're ignoring what God wants. That's another story. But, um, so (laughs) I've just learned like, you know what me and my higher self, what do I want? So I'm releasing songs that are, that are celebrating my queerness, like coming out. And I want to, ha- I'm going to have a dance, dance floor song, like song and that will make people dance. you have coming out this week right here. I do. Yeah. I'm, it's called I'm Yours. And it's another dancey song. You are. Oh, David. <laughs> yeah. I am oh. taken. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's fun. So what I want, I want to be like an Elton John where everyone Mean, loves I and listens to Elton We need John. a new one. Because Elton John, everyone knows he's queer, right? He's gay. And, but, and he can be flamboyant with his outfits and his performances, but his songs appeal to everyone. And I feel like as I've come out, people are like expecting me to be exclusively for, for gay people. And it's like, mm-hmm. I still want music for everybody because I listen to everything. So I don't, it's like, why do I have to suddenly be just a queer artist? Um, I want, but music I think I, I, something everyone. that I've learned in, in, in learning how to tell good stories is that the specific is universal. So if I tell my own experience, I mean, like when people watch some of my videos, people that aren't queer still like my content, people that aren't queer still like what I write because, you know, it, you can tell it in such a way that, well, you know, I, I wasn't bullied for that reason, but I was bullied because, you know, I had a disability or I was bullied because I was this or that or the other. And the specific ends up being universal. If you write from a place of authenticity, of specificity, other people will be able to find themselves in your, in your work. Um, mm. And I, I, I think that I think that aiming for something like that is is beautiful. I will say, um, I do immediately need to know what a little Nas X, David Archuleta collaboration would sound like. I oh now need gosh. that in my ears immediately. I would love that because I am a little Nas X fan. I, I we we need to make that happen. Little Nas X, I'm sure you listen to this show. You're one of the <laughs> seven people that listen. Um, we need to make this happen. Little Nas X. <laughs> David Archuleta. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Actually, your I wonder if I'm like his. Like that would be amazing. It would be so fun. 
so fun. I don't know if I'm like too old for him though. Like, oh, stop. He's a newer generation and I'm like this older, but you know, I, maybe, His my, maybe biggest my music hit was with Billy Ray Cyrus. That's true. Come on now. <laughs> That's true. You're fine. But, He's he's done remixes with a million people. Mariah Carey, you can you, oh. you you got it. You're good. You're good. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, David Archuleta, thank you so much for uh, for being here, for taking the time, for sharing your story, for um, you know the bravery of sharing the high points, the low points, and all points in between, and and um, being authentic and vulnerable with people. Uh, if people would like to connect with you on social media, which you have been killing it on social media lately, congratulations! Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. How how can people do that? Well, they can follow me on Instagram or Twitter on David Archie A R C H I E. Or they can go to davidarcheletta.com and uh, yeah, or David Archuleta on Facebook. So, oh, and he's also wait, on TikTok? TikTok. He's yeah, also on TikTok <laughs> and he does, he do, and folks, he does push up competitions on TikTok. <laughs> he does TikTok dancing. <laughs> Uh, he does okay. he does workout videos. So I'm just saying, <laughs> if you would like to get the full sweaty David Archuleta oh experience, gosh. that oh is the goodness. way to do it. Enjoy, get your life, get your get your uh, David Arch adorable. Um, David Archuleta, thank you so much for being here. This has been a thank pleasure, you, a treat, and a dream. Happy Pride. Thank you, Don. Happy Pride to you as well. <laughs>